Guten Abend, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, tapfere Regenspaziergänger. Freut uns sehr, dass Sie alle da sind, gekommen sind, trotz dieses doch wahrlich nicht gerade fröhlichen Wetters. Welcome everybody. I'm very happy that everybody came despite the rain. Um, and uh, to talk about uh, a wonderful book. Memory is always political and the past is always contested. Um, here in this center we ask ourselves very often why and to what purpose do we remember National Socialism, do we remember the Holocaust, what lessons are we learning from the past and what does the past teach us? We're often being asked by people who visit the center um, after they've seen the permanent exhibition what it tells them about the present, uh, in what ways it helps us to understand the present. And uh, those are questions that we are asking ourselves, what do we teach young people especially, what we talk about and how do we do it, and how do we deal with it. And so I'm very happy that Ishai Sarid in, uh, accepted our invitation and came to Munich from Israel yesterday, and you're going back tomorrow. And we'll talk about his new novel with us. Um, it is his fourth book. The second one, Limassol, became an international bestseller, uh, as well as the third, which became also a major subject of public and literary discussion in Israel and won the Bernstein Literary Award. And now his fourth book, Monster, or as it is called in Hebrew, uh, uh, the, the monster of memory. Um, the most fascinating thing, uh, there are two fascinating things I have to say about this book. One is Ishai Sarid works full time as an attorney, um, formerly as a public prosecutor and now privately. That is absolutely amazing uh, given the fact that another very important book on the Holocaust was written by a lawyer. Philippe Sands, um, and um, well, that poses the questions, where does it leave us historians? <laughs> uh, and a book that was, uh, that was discussed in Israel, the poet Navid Barel called it the most meaningful book ever written uh, about morals and victimhood. And it is a book, if you have not yet uh, read it, uh, it is a book that is hard to put out of your hand. So the moment you start it, make sure you have enough time to finish it. Uh, it is absolutely fascinating, um, sometimes also, one might say, irritating, uh, definitely thought-provoking. And so I'm very happy that you came um, and will discuss this book with me and with all of us. Um, and I um, just want to mention that you can uh, purchase it outside, and uh, I hope that you'll be signing the copies as well. Yes, Isha will be signing, so I'm very glad. Uh, and I don't want to say more about the book. Uh, I'll like to pass on the word to you uh, and let you sort of start with the first introduction on how this book came to be. The issue was uh, whether to write, uh, how to write about this uh, subject, because the um, the Holocaust is very much um, uh, alive in our psychology, in our souls, both uh, personally and um, collectively as a society. It's the one, um, I think, it's the most influencing factor of uh, Israeli lives. In many ways, it's um, a trauma, huge trauma that uh, was never treated. And um, I, um, I deal with it uh, for many years now. I read whatever I could uh, lay my hands on, both survivors' uh, uh, memories and the uh, story books and philosophy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and it's 
deterring to write prose about the Holocaust because I didn't want to invent a Holocaust story. I don't like Holocaust stories. I don't like a manipulation of um, emotions based on the, the Holocaust. Uh, but still I'm writer, so I, I had to do something with it. It took a long time. Um, maybe I should start by saying that uh, my family name is Sarid. It wasn't always Sarid. It was um, changed in, um, it was originally, the family name was originally Schneider. Schneider in Yiddish, I believe it's a tailor. And, um, also in German. Okay. And uh, so somebody in the family was, I suppose, a tailor in uh, some day. And um, in 1945, um, my grandfather um, uh, called my father then. My father was five years old. But it was kind of uh, the most serious uh, moments of his life. They lived in a small village um, uh, in Israel. Then it was Palestine. There was no state of Israel then, uh, 1945. And my late uh, grandfather um, was uh, going to, uh, he was a teacher, and he was going to teach um, children of um, uh, Holocaust survivors in a transition camp in uh, Europe before coming um, to uh, other places. And he told my father, from now on, our name will be Sarid. Sarid in Hebrew is a remnant. And he told him, we'll be called Sarid because the, we are the only remnants of our family um, from the terrible Holocaust that happened in, the, um, in Europe. I'm not sure, actually, I'm not sure it was called Holocaust back then, Shoah. Uh, I think it's, um, the term was, um, uh, was used just afterwards. Um, the history of the family, very briefly, um, I had two grandmothers. Uh, one of them ca came in the mid 30s uh, from Lvov. Lvov is a country now. It's it's a city now in Ukraine. It used to be uh, Poland. Um, and she came when she was 19, by by herself. She wasn't a member of any youth movement or something like this. And uh, the reason she came is because she was a very um, uh, educated and intelligent young woman. But in Poland, in those days, there was already the numerous clauses that didn't allow, the, didn't allow um, uh, Jewish people to go to universities as they wanted. Um, and she had a high school teacher who was not Jewish. And she told her, listen, you have no future here in Poland or in Europe. I heard there's a call, place called Palestine somewhere in, in the east where uh, Jewish uh, start new life, and maybe you should consider it go to uh, Palestine. And that's what she did, and that's the way, of course, she saved their lives. She had one sister. Um, my grandmother told me she was uh, prettier than her, the sister, and she was more uh, involved in society. And that's why she, my grandmother told her, listen, come, come with me. But she said, I have a good life here and I don't want uh, to go. And the mother, the, the father passed away from some illness. And um, uh, to her last day, uh, my grandmother didn't know um, what, uh, of course, they were murdered somehow, but she didn't, there were all kinds of rumors, but she didn't know where and when exactly they were um, murdered. And that's about uh, Fania. Her name was Fania Taube. She, she lived until the age of 96. She passed away a few years ago. Um, we never talked about the Holocaust. Uh, it wasn't the subject of discussion. I think she was never you know, treated somehow. She never dealt with, with this uh, subject. Uh, 
she wasn't a happy woman. She loved us very much, and you know, she built a family and uh, was a nurse for many years, and uh, she painted, but uh, uh, she wasn't happy. The, um, the other grandmother called Dobel uh, Grober. She um, uh, was born and um, raised in a very little town in Ukraine called Refalovke, somewhere in the woods. I don't know. I've never been there. Um, and it's for a, they were a poor family. I think there were some very small merchants of something, maybe of wood. And um, the interesting thing that um, uh, my grandmother and few of her, they were a large family, and my grandmother and few of her sisters were uh, socialists and Zionists, and they came to Palestine also during mid-1930s. And they, were, um, they, they wrote letters to Poland, to, to Ukraine, to this uh, place, and got letters back in Yiddish. And um, a few years ago, somebody from the family translated them to Hebrew. And they are fascinating. They are talking about, you know, little things of life, about livelihoods and about the family and about uh, how the um, um, parents who stayed there with the smaller children, two th small children of the family, wanted also to come to the land of Israel, but they said it will take us some time. And then the correspondence stopped somewhere in 1941 when the Germans uh, entered there. And we know now for sure that um, uh, all the um, uh, few hundreds uh, uh, Jewish population of this town who lived there for, I don't know, hundreds of years before were executed in the same days by uh, shooting uh, in the woods there and, um, and that's it. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know her because um, she she passed away before many years before I was born. So and that's not exceptional for Israel. And um, uh, we know that nowadays, when a cat catastrophe or some disaster or terror attack or some ordinary uh, crime occurs. Uh, with the social services and psychologists and uh, we, n we give help to those people, to the victims and their families trying to go on with their lives. Um, and those people didn't, you know, didn't get anything because they immediately from what happened in Europe, they were dropped into the uh, very difficult uh, situation of the creating of the state of Israel, the, the wars. Um, they needed to build a new country, so nobody had time and energy and didn't feel obligated to, to give them this assistance. Nobody could give it to them. And that's the, but it doesn't go away. Just when the, the years pass, I think you can imagine that maybe the influence of the Holocaust will become lesser a little bit, but it's not, it's not the case at all. But it goes in all kind of weird directions because history is not a constant, the perception of history by people is not a constant thing. It changes all the time and that's why generally my, uh, my book uh, deals with. Um, during time I became um, uh, obsessed by um, um, by the details of what I read. I read everything and I really wanted to understand what happened. You know, the details, the historic details of the extermination process. And I read a lot about, about it until one day I told myself, listen, this is too much. Because there is some kind of fascination with the subject, of, with the evilness, with the with this terrible thing. Um, now, I, I was to, um, I've been to Poland, um, in recent years I've been a few times, but I've been to Poland in 1983. This was the, the year when the first uh, Israel youth delegation went there. I was uh, 18 there, I was a high school student, uh, last year of my uh, high school, and um, they took us to, to Auschwitz and uh, other places. Of 
because I was a good history student and I, I understood st things, but um, the, my main, you know, it was, on those days we didn't go a lot abroad, you know, and it was Poland during the communist era, it was kind of, you know, mysterious and, uh, and mainly what I, I remember is that I was very much in love with one of the girls in my group and that was the main interest for me. Because what can you do when you are 18, you are interested by certain things which, you know, are more important to you. Um, you know that nowadays, if I don't answer a question, you can cut me short whenever you want. But uh, as long as you allow me, so I'll take the, use the opportunity. Um, nowadays, almost all Israeli high school students go to Poland in... Um, kind of a pilgrimage to the death camps there. March of the Living. Pardon? March of the Living. Yes, March of the Living is the, the peak of the once a year, but they go also to um, uh, kind of regular uh, tours there. It's kind of a, a passage right uh, for, for young people in Israel. They go in groups with their schools. Um, so I decided to, um, uh, to write about it. I, um, in 2016, after many years since the first uh, um, uh, voyage there, I went again to Poland. I took a car from uh, Warsaw Airport and went for in two weeks during, went through all the death camps in uh, Poland. Not all concentration camps, of course, because there were many, many of them, but death camps per se were uh, much fewer. And they, uh, I was very shaken from this experience. It's different when you are 50 than when you are 18, when you have a family and children and uh, your emotional... Um, it's, it was much different and I took it very hard. Um, because these are terrible places until nowadays. Um, and I also tried to, you know, to see, for example, in um, Sobibor, you have the um, line of little stones with the names of the communities from which uh, people were murdered there, all parts of Europe from Holland, from uh, all, all, all over the place, all over the continent. And until nowadays, Sobibor is a very remote place in the, in the ancient woods of Europe, in the eastern uh, Poland, in the, near the border with uh, Belarus and the Ukraine, very remote area. And just thinking about the people taken there by trains, and they were taken, it was built there because it's a very remote area, far away from public eye. Yeah. But there was a, a train going there. There was a, and it was a little, very little effort, by the way. And thinking about the people taken there, you know, from their lives uh, with their children and murdered the same day was completely horrible. The helplessness. Um, and also the notion that it was, it was not high-tech, it was very, very simple operation of uh, taking people like, um, like garbage, actually. Sorry for that, but that was the way it was. And taken for place, places where they were get, gotten rid of. A uh, very simple uh, mechanism of, uh, and also very small uh, manpower, German manpower needed for this because uh, most of the dirty work was made by uh, uh, forced Jewish uh, prisoners and Ukrainians as guards. There were 20, 30, 40 uh, permanent uh, SS uh, people in each uh, camp like this. And the hundreds of thousands uh, are murdered there. And when I came back, my wife told me, listen, you are not, you are not fine. And um, the only thing I could do was to eventually write this book. Uh, it's, um, it's written by, uh, it's a letter written by a, a 
historian, young uh, Israeli historian whose expertise in the Holocaust, who also guides uh, groups like this to uh, Poland. And he writes a letter to the chairman of Yad Vashem, which is the main Israeli uh, organization who deals with the memory of the, the Holocaust, makes a very important uh, work. And he describes the period in which he was a guide and what happened um, in the way and what happened last. So that's a short answer to your question. <laughs> One of the fascinating things that your book manages to do is you're focusing on, or it is focusing on this letter that is written by a young historian, a guide, who is um, doing many of those tours and eventually um, it's very, it's getting harder and harder for him to draw a line between what happened and between his life. So uh, his wife also tells him, you don't look well, um, but he doesn't, well, he writes a letter. So, uh, and he does something which is cathartic at the end. Um, but the interesting thing, and that I found really fascinating about your book, is that, yes, it is fiction, and as you said, Holocaust fiction is always something problematic, and we just had a long discussion here in Germany on the book of uh, Takis Würger, Stella. Um, but at the same time, and, and you are, as a reader, you follow his troubles, his the development of this figure, and you're, you're drawn in and you're fascinated by this figure. And accidentally, by the way, one learns an enormous amount of details on the examination of European Jewry in the various camps, which I've never seen in any other book in that sense, because usually you would say, okay, I have to go and sit and read a history book that tells me all the details about how people were murdered in... Uh, in Sobibor and in Auschwitz and in Treblinka. And um, by reading your novel, it's kind of something, it's very educational in that sense. Um, but at the same time, it does criticize the act of memory and remembrance, or not criticize, but question what is sort of the purpose of it? What, what happens, what does it do to Israeli society? Uh, and that is a very, very interesting tension that um, I think that no matter if you're Israeli, you read it from a different perspective, but also in Germany, it's, it's, it's most um, insightful. Um, and I was thinking of uh, an article that was written by the late Yehuda el Kana in the early 1990s in Aaretz, when he actually demanded or suggested that Israel should forget about the Holocaust. And I remember there were long discussions by historians and colleagues and everybody said, oh, he's wrong, he's wrong. Why should we forget about the Holocaust? This is the trauma, this is the legacy. Uh, this is so important for us and for our identity. Um, and, uh, and it was a time, I think, when he was really in the, or it had arrived in the center of Israeli identity in many ways, because it took some time. I think until the Eichmann tri trial, it was not, and survivors were sort of on the fringes of society. But after the Eichmann trial, it really changed, and um, survivors became very present in society. And uh, I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but from kindergarten age on, children would learn about this trauma and would listen to the stories of survivors. Um, so um, El Kana was, of course, this was a big provocation in many ways. Um, but it's, I think that is, it's something that is also uh, being discussed in your book. Is memory, is it good to remember uh, for Israeli society? Or what does it do to society? Um, first of all, the, the Israel took uh, uh, very important and strategic decision in very early stage, 1950, 1951, Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, when uh, signing the compensation um, agreement with uh, Germany, which is of course relates to your question because um, 
it wasn't the obvious decision to make. Um, many people in Israel, in Israel in those days, um, for example, Menachem Begin, who many years later became the prime minister, was the leader of the, op of the opposition then, said, how can we um, come in terms with our murderers and take money from them? It, you know, it's, it's a shame for the, um, for, for the nation, for the people. But Ben-Gurion took the, this decision because he understood that um, like a people, like a person, a private person that just was, was hit in or beat or um, badly hurt and just sits all day long and scratches his wounds cannot do anything. And uh, he said we must in a certain way leave it behind us to enable us to build to build a nation, to build a state, to build buildings, to bring people from the diaspora, to build an army, etc., agriculture, etc., etc., and that, that's why, and they also needed the money, it must be said, to create this new state. So this is the historic uh, agreement between Adenauer and uh, Ben-Gurion. And that's, maybe we'll talk about it later, because it turned history, the memory of the Holocaust into something a little bit strange in Israel, because they developed a real and strange love story between Israel and Germany, we must admit it. Now, do you ask me if we have to remember? Of course we have to remember. I mean, these are my grandparents, you know. I don't want to forget uh, what was done to them. It's, all, it's also very important to remember it and to teach it as a lesson for the future. But the question is what are we doing as Israelis with this memory? That's, that's the story of, part of the story, uh, the subject of, um, of my book. Because it's, there are all kinds of twists to, to this memory, for example, um, if you ask Israeli young people, young uh, high school students or uh, elementary school students, of course they know the Germans are responsible for the Holocaust and they in initiated it, etc., etc. But um, when you ask them a few more questions, you'll get from many, many of them, maybe majority of young people in Israel now, the, the main um, um, the blame should be put mainly on the Polish people, which is of course not true. I mean, there were many Polish people who were uh, collaborators with the Nazis, with the German occupation, and uh, there was a very deep anti-Semitism uh, rooted in uh, Poland. But the Polish people are not responsible for the Holocaust. What can you do? But that's the way it is, it's, it, it becomes twisted. And then you get all kind of strange notions, for example, our prime minister, our beloved prime minister. Uh, Netanyahu said a few years ago, and that was really strange because he knows history. His father was historian, he knows history, he's not, he's not an idiot. And they said the idea for the final solution was gave to Hitler by the Mufti of Jerusalem, the Arab Muslim, Muslim Mufti of Jerusalem, who was a collaborator of the Nazis, who was a very bad person, who liked the, um, the Jewish people to be exterminated, but to say that he was the initiator, the, the, um, you know, the thinker of the... And that, of course, it serves a political uh, purpose of our prime minister, you know, to incite against the Arabs and put um, uh, different um, picture of history, which is, of course, wrong. Now, and I write it about, uh, there is a scene in my book where um, um, also my protagonist is a part, works in a, as an um, expert in a plan um, to bring uh, Israeli elite commando unit to Poland to conquer in a ceremonial way uh, one of the death camps. 
and they have to decide whether it will be Treblinka or uh, Majdanek or one of the other places. And of course, there will be all this media and et cetera, et cetera, to mark the 75 um, anniversary, anniversary of the Vans uh, uh, conference. Uh, this is fiction. But it was based upon um, uh, uh, Israeli Air Force flight that uh, happened a few years ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It made a lot of uh, media uh, impression. A few uh, Israeli Air Force um, uh, airplanes, F-15 or F-16, I don't remember, flew over Auschwitz. And um, uh, this picture is a very famous one in Israel, and it's hanged in the offices of many important uh, officials as a sign of how we overcame the past. And actually, we are the victors. In the end, in the end, we are victorious from this uh, mess. That's, you know, I served in the army for uh, six years. I was officer in the army. There's no argument about the need of Israel and of Jewish people to be strong. I mean, this is a good lesson for Jewish people, I think. But to mark it as a victory, you know, to try to re rewrite history, um, that's absurd, of course. The only thing you can do in those places is to be silent or say some very wise um, poetry, which exists, and teach about what happened here. But in any way, you cannot um, change history and uh, show some um, fake um, fake uh, pictures of, uh, of reality. This would be one of the examples that history always serves our present needs and present political interests. Um, and, and this is something that goes back also to, I think, the early, in a different way, sort of, the, the, the way how Israel started to remember the Holocaust. Because, of course, those who would talk about it, first of all, they were few, because many survivors wouldn't talk, and they were not in the center of society. Um, I think many of the novels of Aaron Appelfeld illustrate their difficult way into Israeli society and their difficult way of overcoming the trauma. Um, but also uh, uh, those who would speak would, of course, the, the surviving ghetto fighters like Abakov, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Abakovna, uh, no, Stutzka would talk less, but Abakovna would be a central figure. Um, and those who would uh, be in many ways after all, victorious. So uh, the early Yad Vashem would really remember uh, the gvura, the, 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 the bravery, uh, more than, than the victims. This changed with the second museum in Yad Vashem, where it's uh, in a d sort of putting the, the victims much more in the center. Um, but for the early state of Israel, it was a very important move to decide what do we remember. We remember that after all, uh, we were fighters. We, we, we did not go like uh, uh, sheep to the, um, to, to the slaughter. Yeah, I'm looking for my, I have my, um, this is the original Hebrew book, but we probably don't understand most of you Hebrews. So um, where did I put it? I want to to read to, to read the is it okay yeah okay it was the animalistic urge to survive at any cost that kept the machine moving as well as the man's submissiveness submissiveness in the face of unstoppable power that was what the German method relied on. I would have done the same, I told them. He tells his, the group he guides. And you probably would have to. We would have all carried bodies from gas chambers to crematorium, pulling gold teeth from their mouths, 
shearing their hair to feed it into the fire if it meant staying alive one more day, one more hour, one more minute. We mustn't use the expression like lamb to the slaughter. That's what you kept telling us at, at the guide course. It's equally forbidden at the university. I was always obedient, never using it. But the truth is, we both know that exp that expression is too delicate and merciful. Lambs are not killed with poison. They are slaughtered, the flesh and wool spared. The lambs are loved, caressed, fed f fresh grass, while the Jews were poisoned with insecticide. I should have told them that breaking their meaningless melancholy, putting an end to the playing of bl bland songs on the guitars, the Kaddish, the tears, the candles, all that, all that feel good nonsense. I sketched a complete picture of the murderers and their assistants for myself, their customs and agenda, their tools and the rules with which they operated, but I didn't know the victims. It was impossible in terms of quantity and words beyond the bounds of my research. Standing before these groups, I listed the names of countries from which transport arrived at each camp, as well as the number of victims, but I didn't say their names. There were so many. Where would I even begin? And they were all treated the same way, like dog food ingredients. I brought the students to the display cases at the Auschwitz Museum filled with hair suitcases, processes, shoes, and said these were people. I wanted them to think about their youngest siblings, their parents, their children, and themselves. I couldn't carry that burden myself. So there was a change. But, but even nowadays, when you go to those places and you take the young uh, people there, in a sense, you recreate the extermination, the murder process again and again. You don't see the people. That, that is one of the things that haunt my uh, uh, guy here because he tries to see the eyes of the victims, to hear their voices, and he couldn't do it. What he can do, you know, there are pictures of the murderers. We know we have every year um, uh, new biographies of the Nazi uh, um, uh, commanders, which some of them are bestsellers, and we have a fascination with it. So in a way, in a strange and twisted way, the heroes of the, um, of the Holocaust and of the, war, or, and of the war remain the villains. How can you tell about a, a person who was, how, how do you start talking about six million people? You, you cannot do it. Now, the other issue is, you are right that in the first days of Israel, there was another issue. There was the issue of shame and blame put on the, on the survivors. How come you didn't um, hit back? How come you didn't uh, try to kill your murderers? Additional to survivors' guilt. That of people of felt course. bad that they were the only ones who survived. Because you must remember, in the same time, they're creating the new Jewish character in Israel, in the, the land of Israel, who is courageous, who is strong, who looks differently, you know, who is a farmer, is not, uh, his hands are uh, like farmers, you know, and suddenly those people come from, from Europe with this unbelievable story, and people in Israel told them, how come you didn't um, fight back? which was, of course, you know, uh, impossible. Some of them, a very few, fought back in the Warsaw uh, ghetto uprising, etc. But you couldn't do it. And it also took very long, as you said, it's very difficult to grasp the memory and the legacy of six million people, but also it took very long in historiography until their story was told at all. It was better in Israel, but in Germany, I remember until the 1990s, it was not appropriate of working with the, the documents by, written by the victims because these were too subjective, whereas whatever the murderers had produced were actual objective documents. 
I remember this was really a fight. As a history student, you had to make your case, and it was very difficult to make your case to say, but I want to work with diaries, and I want to work with the, the sources that we have of the, uh, of, on, the, on the victim side, um, because they were not considered uh, an objective uh, point of view. Um, the same goes for, for example, images. Many of the images we have from the Holocaust are images that were taken by the perpetrators, and we see the perpetrators in the eyes of the victims. Uh, and we see the victims sort of as the perpetrators want to portray them. Yeah, that's because on, on one side you have this very systematic machine, which is well documented. Not many pictures because they try to hide it, but here and there I, I talk about it. There are some strange pictures, you know, taken by uh, the, the SS people in the camps from now and then. And on the other hand, you have, you, you have those helpless people were ordinary people, and from time to time, very rarely they could write something, or uh, which is, of course, uh, very, very important. Now, when I came back in 1983 from um, um, Poland, um, the, the only lesson I had, people asked me, my parents and other people, I, I remember I was uh, called to a radio studio, to a radio program, because it was a big deal now, then. It was the first time uh, it happened. What, what, what's your lesson from this uh, tour? So, of course, I said, we have to be strong, which is a good lesson. But then you ask yourself, when you, you become a little bit older and maybe wiser, is this the only lesson uh, we learn from the, the Holocaust? And this is why I deal very much in the, um, in the book, because that's the lesson until nowadays uh, people get. We have to be strong. We have to be able to defend ourselves. All very good lessons, by the way. But is this the, the only thing um, uh, we do? And then my protagonist, my guide, starts to ask himself all kinds of difficult questions. What would I do if I was there in different positions? For example, I will read another passage. Okay. It wasn't still uh, published in, the, in English. It's going to be just next year, so everything may. On the way to Krakow, I introduced them to the righteous among the nations, Anna R. This is, by the way, a true story taken from Yad Vashem uh, uh, Chronicles. An old woman who remained in a small village her entire life. These days, her grandchildren work her farm with an old tractor and a donkey. I liked her. Her kindness melted my heart, and I think she liked me too. She always seemed happy to see me. On nice days, she would come out to meet us in the yard, and on the rainy days, we would crowd inside a small house. She spoke Polish, and one of her granddaughters translated her words into broken English. Then I told them the story in Hebrew. One night during the war, she and her late husband heard a knock on the door. A boy was standing in the doorway, filthy, covered with lies, and starving. Without giving the matter a second thought, they let him in. He told them he'd fled from the Germans and the Polish police, that his hometown had been surrounded, the Jews pillaged, beaten, those who tried to run were killed, and the others were taken by train to an unknown destination. The boy's entire family was put in the train while he'd managed to run to the woods and survive for a few weeks, eating foods he had stolen from farms. By the time he came, by the time he came knocking on the door, he was prepared to die of hunger, cold, and grief. Anna took pity on him, bathing him, feeding him, and washing his clothes. He spent that night in their home, and when she awakened the next day, she asked him to leave fearing for themselves and for the children. 
But the sun shone, she said, always smiling when she reached this part, and the boy decided he wanted to leave and beg to stay. I wanted to send him away, Anna confessed. I knew what the Germans were capable of, but my husband said, we've got, to, we've got no choice, we've got to let him stay. She agreed. They set up a hiding place for him in the barn, tasking their eldest daughter, who was 12 years old at the, at the time, with serving his meals, sometimes under cover of dark, when the coast was clear, they invited him into their home to dine with them or warm himself at the fireplace. Her face lit up when she described it. A few months later, they heard the Germans had burned down the house of a family who had harbored Jews in a nearby village. Hearing this, the boy said he would return to the woods, though they didn't ask him to. to. But they remained in touch with him. Twice a week, they would hide food and clothes for him in a secret spot on the outskirts of the forest. Sruli, Anna said in a conclusion, putting her hands together. That was his name, and he lived, he lived, he stayed alive. Applaud her, I, co I commanded them. Applause, right now, as loud as you can. Who among you would have rescued a strange, filthy boy who knocked on your door at night, putting your own life and the lives of your children at risk? I asked them in our nightly session at the hotel. Silence, then whispering, their brains ground through the options. How to get out of this? He isn't one of your people, I reminded them. He is of a different faith. You don't even know him. You have no obligation towards him other than being humans. A few raised their hands. Would you die for him, I persisted? Would you risk having your home set on fire with you and your children inside? At this point, the hands usually came down. There are no specific characteristics that define the righteous among the nations, I told them. You'll find hardly any famous, successful genius or exceptionally intellectual people on the list. Most of them were just regular people, like Miss Anna, whom we visited today. I have no idea how many books she's read in her lifetime. She didn't attend high school, that's for sure. She spent her entire life working in the field and on tending on the pigs, on a farm and raising children. But she has a good heart, she took him in. There were plenty of other people, murderers, cowards, who burned Jews alive, who turned them in, but there were also people like this. I asked myself, I told them, what would I have done in her place? I don't know, I would probably be too afraid to take the risk, and it's killing me. It won't let me go because that's the only questions we can ask ourselves as human beings. So, um, these are, and he knows all the details of the process, etc. but then he's uh, on a dead end because he, uh, he has no answer for those questions. Is there a universal Legacy. I remember the discussions of the 90s, um, whether it's a Jewish or sort of the, the, the uniqueness of the Holocaust, the Jewish history of the Holocaust, and on the other hand, the German legacy, um, and the wish on both sides not to universalize, because it was important to say that it was a German crime and it was the German story, and on the other hand, it was the, the Jewish suffering so did we miss something there when we when we not agree i think there was there was a there was a fear or wish not to universalize and say like you you know what are the universal values um and i think in in that way also israel and germany are bound together so closely from this experience um but is is there something we we might have missed on the way holocaust is indeed unique in its size in its you know, motivations in the, the way it was done, there's no doubt about it. But you don't have to reach such a size of atrocity and monstrosity uh, to ask yourself uh, moral questions. Uh, and Holocaust should 
tell us a lesson, how not to reach there, how to be, you know, sorry for the, to be, how to be good people, you know. Uh, because saying, if it's not a holocaust, you know, we are doing whatever we want, I don't accept it. i give you an example. For example, there are uh, many, many uh, refugees from Africa, especially from Eritrea, which, is a, which has a terrible dictatorship there, came to Israel um, uh, in recent years. Now there is a wall, so they cannot pass, and they started arriving. But um, in past years, Tens of thousands um, of them came through the Sinai Desert, also from Sudan. Uh, miserable people um, running away from uh, persecution and wars and uh, poverty and hunger, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there was a big, con and they reached Israel mainly to the outskirts of Tel Aviv, to southern Tel Aviv, to the poorer uh, regions. And there is until nowadays a big public discussion in Israel and the political discussion, how do we receive those people? Do we have a moral obligation that is beyond the moral obligation of the usual nations and politicians because our past or we can behave uh, like everybody else? Should we be more sensitive towards people who are fleeing from uh, desperate situations for their life actually? Or we can be like others you know, who didn't open the gates in uh, those days without making any comparison. And the decision the Israeli government uh, took with the support of majority of the people that we are not obligated to, you know, being uh, better than uh, other nations. Of course, we didn't kill them, God forbid. We didn't kill them, we didn't murder them, we didn't execute them, you know. they. Most of them were allowed to stay until we deport them to back to their homes, but they were not given any civil uh, uh, rights. You know, they have no, nothing uh, actually. Um, and I thought this is an issue we should learn from our past. But if the only lesson is that you have to take care of your interests and be very strong and um, uh, you can be very selfish because you were a victim of the most outrageous and worst atrocity in the history of the world. So uh, the, you have no special duties. I don't think so, but most Israelis do think so. And it's a big, big difference when you are, um, uh, you don't have a country, you don't have a home, you are helpless, and when you sit on your land and you own your own home, things look very different then. Things look very different, yes. Um, and by the way, I would teach the righteous among the nations stories much more than they are teach to, taught today, because this is the, the best moral lesson you can teach til children and older people, uh, those uh, bravery stories. They are not taught enough. They're not hot enough, and it's interesting to look at the, at the lists according uh, to the nations, and I think I remember, I think in, in the Pauline Museum in Warsaw, you can see them, that the longest list is the Polish one, uh, much, much, much longer than the German one, for example. Yeah, but on the same on the same time, there were m much more Jewish people there. There are about, but there, there are more than 7,000 uh, righteous among the nations recognized by Yad Vashem from Poland. Think about it. More than 7,000 people risk their lives, not Jewish people. That's the category, by, by the way, which is kind of also under uh, discussion. But 7,000 people risk their lives and the lives of other people uh, of, and of their families to risk uh, Jewish people. That's, that's not small. Of course, there were much more who were very bad people and uh, collaborated, etc. But we must, you know, commemorate the good people. Otherwise, how in the next, when it, uh, something bad happens in the, the future, how can we teach people to be like those people and not like the villains? This is one of the big questions, what kind of lessons we draw from the past. I think it was Ruth Kluger that at a certain point said, uh, look, Auschwitz was not a place where you would learn to be a good person or to be a sort of morally better person. And I'm, I'm sure she's right in that sense. Um, but to contrast your story about Israel in 2015 when Germany opened its borders, um, 
sort of after a long um, period of time when Germany had uh, sort of troubles uh, accepting its past, and it took long here as well, and then until the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s. Um, and then in 2015, when Angela Merkel said, uh, we welcome refugees, I remember that many Germans abroad, especially in the U.S., um, rejoiced in seeing this different nation and uh, and many countries reacted by saying Germany looks completely different today and it was again Ruth Klüger who said this is a different Germany from what I've known um, and I think it was a very important experience for many people and I think that many people still in Germany continue the work that they started in 2015. There are many, many initiatives uh, um, sort of of people working with refugees, helping refugees, and, and so on. Um, on the other hand, we also know that there is a certain backlash um, that uh, was not anticipated then. So the past is a very complicated matter uh, for, for recent politics. But this is the real test. I mean... You can talk about things, and uh, I don't exclude myself, by the way, from it. You know, I don't do enough. But uh, you can talk about things, and you can brag about things, and you can uh, say all kinds. But the real test is how you behave um, uh, by yourself. And that's what we don't teach our children uh, enough. At a certain point in the book, you write, um, it's a very central moment when the guide uh, says to himself, we shouldn't have brought you here, these young people, all these young Israelis. We should have brought you to Paris to see the Grand Boulevards. We should have brought you to Italy to eat the best food that is available in Europe. We should have brought you to Egypt. Why are we bringing you to Poland? Or to, or to, if you want to deal with the Holocaust, let's bring you to Germany, you know. See where it started, where it was initiated. And I also wrote that the Germans had that was in purpose, you know, to do the dirty work somewhere in the East and not litter, sorry for saying it, your streets and villages with these atrocities. And it worked out historically in the end very nice for them because, you know, the, the, the extermination is connected with Poland nowadays, not here. And the Polish people have to suffer from, you know, it's, uh, when it's connected to them more than with the Germans. Um, yes, listen, I, I, we struggle it. I have three children, and it's all the time the issue of how much burden you put on him with the memory and with history. Um, every year we have the Holocaust uh, Memorial Day, and there is a siren uh, for two, uh, two minutes uh, screaming in the streets, and everybody stands and remembers the... Uh, and remembers... Um, but then there is issue, when do you start it? You start it with kindergarten, kindergarten children. What do you tell kindergarten children? How they can cope with this terrible thing? And uh, that's why I said maybe we, we, we did you wrong, you know. Let's, uh, let's leave. Why do, you, why do we put, put it on you, you know? Why do you have to start your adult life by, by going to those terrible places? By the way, I think people should go there because uh, it's the best way to understand the Holocaust is going, I think, to those places. I would take them also to Germany, to the places where it was initiated, but not on this age, not when you are 17 or 18. It's interesting that we, we rarely have Israeli groups coming here, and I think this would be one of the places where you could really understand where things started and how you... Um, uh, you know, how, how fragile democracy is as well, sort of step by step, because this is what this center is about, what happened in the 1920s um, and then in the early 1930s. Um, but as you said, Germany in many ways, sort of Germany and Israel bound, bound together uh, through, this, uh, through this fate, uh, possibly eternally. Um, and it's interesting that some 15 years ago, it started that it was suddenly okay to go to Germany for Israelis. Before that, it wasn't really okay. But then there was suddenly this hype of the new unified Berlin, um, which I think is also connected to the fact that Berlin took on this 
obligation to commemorate and, you know, it's Stolperstein and Holocaust Memorial. And so it was okay to go to Berlin. And uh, today, and we all know that, you all know that when you uh, have a coffee somewhere in Berlin Mitte, uh, most likely the waiter will be an Israeli or the waitress. Um, and you hear, hear a lot of uh, Hebrew on the streets, and I don't know what the numbers are. At a certain point, it was said that 30,000 young Israelis uh, have moved to Berlin, um, which is, of course, not the case for Warsaw, for example. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I've been, I must say I've been to Berlin twice or three times in literary um, festivals or... Um, and uh, also here this time in Munich. Uh, sorry for you are not to, you know, but uh, I have, my heart is very heavy here. I, um, it's it's hard for me being here because history lays uh, too much on me. Also in Berlin, but for many many Israelis, it's it's you know they're not going there for the Holocaust memory. They are going there for fun and for nightclubs and for museums, etc. Uh, etc. Et uh, which is strange to me, but on the other end, you know, it's, um, people see it, it's, a, uh, for example, um, my daughter, who is going to be um, 18 soon, is going with her friends to Berlin in a few months. What can I tell her? Don't go to Berlin. I wouldn't tell her that, you know, so uh, th that's, that's the way it is. Good friends of mine um, go to the Black Forest every year in the summer for the family vacation. And they all over the years they ask me, "Would you come to us to the Black Forest?" I tell them, "No way! I'm going with my family to the Black Forest for vacation." You know, uh, let's not exaggerate. Um, is but there, but is there <laughs> reconciliation in memory? Is there a, can there be a joint Israeli and German memory? No, I think I your book says uh, something else, right? No, there is. There is a love story. Let's face it. You know, when uh, uh, people in Israel support the German team in the World Cup, in uh, you know, so okay. Um, of course, I'm not looking for revenge or you know, of hostility or not, uh, something like this. But I think it's too, you know, um, uh, it's too much. But that's the way it is. The fact is that I'm talking to you and you are nice people. So, but um, it hit me. There was a few years ago um, a meeting between um, Israeli and German writers organized by the Goethe Institute in uh, in Israel was in Mishkenot Shananim, which is a very nice place, a cultural center in Jerusalem. And it was two days, and uh, the subject was something about the future. I don't know, I don't remember exactly the, the subject. But in five minutes, the uh, German writers took it to the, to the issue of the Holocaust. And started talking about the issue, and they started telling their stories, their family stories about the war. And we talked about it, and it was like this for two days. And um, after two days, there was this final discussion uh, to sum up the, the event. And I told them, listen, I, I must be frank with you. I felt very uneasy. Because it was as, as, as um, we, are, we are talking about the Holocaust from the same side. It's a common experience. We were there, and you were there, and it's, uh, we suffered, and you suffered, and you know, you are very sorry, but you know, it's, uh, it's all in a very friendly atmosphere. Now, nah, I'm not with you in this subject, and uh, I don't know how we came to this uh, discussion because we are not on the same side, and uh, let's be clear. And they were very surprised. Also the organizers from the ghetto, which were very nice and, you know, had all the good intentions because they told, told me no, nobody talked to us like this before about the, the issue. Um, I, I don't know what to do about it, you know. It's, um, but you must, it's, it's a deeper issue because Israelis be, um, are longing to Europe. And, um, um, and Europe is a model of 
you know, of many good things for um, for Israelis and especially Germany because it's uh, it's beautiful, it's efficient, it's a democracy, it's well governed, um, it's tolerant, and um, we are not very welcomed in our neighborhood in the Middle East. So people in Israel go to Europe. And uh, they want to be very much, again, part of Europe. You know, we had the Eurovision Song Contest, this terrible thing in Israel uh, uh, a few days ago. It was very nice because it was a big festival on the beach, and, you know, people were very happy about it, which is something important. Uh, not uh, everyone is, you know, uh, snobs like me. And... Um, it was very much that Israelis want to be hugged by Europe again. You know, we want to be welcomed. We want to be loved. Um, we want to be part of Europe once again, which is, of course, impossible because... Uh, um, and this is part of the story of the Israeli-German um, uh, issue. Going back to Berlin, you know, you can look at it from the um, uh, opposite side, you know, how beautiful it is the Jewish people are com coming back to Berlin after all that happened. Okay, that's another way to, to look at it. There was another conference in uh, Mishkanot Shananim some 15 years ago. It was a huge conference uh, on the history of the Yekes of the German Jews, which became a legendary conference with historians and survivors and Yekes and everybody being there. And um, I, I think it was uh, a way of also sort of finding the German roots of the state of Israel because, of course, many of the Zionists, the early Zionists, were Germans, um, especially in the fourth Aliyah and the third and the fourth Aliyah. And then the fifth Aliyah, of course, the many refugees that came from Germany who were then hiding their German culture and, uh, and feeling ashamed of it. But then it was kind of a celebration of these, uh, this kind of like, it was kind of a reconciliation in many ways, uh, celebrating the, the sh shared uh, German Jewish heritage, which I think started a little bit this sort of outburst of a love affair, which before that was kind of uh, more hesitant. Yeah, but we were thrown away from here, you know, and were murdered, and so let's not do it from it what it's not. And uh, there's also a funny issue of Israelis um, wanting to to keep you Europe European, you know, and um, saying and really get um, disturbed and annoyed by all the immigration to Europe by um, Africans and uh, Asians and Middle Eastern. What are, what are they doing to our Europe, you know? You know, the, our good, white, uh, pure Europe, which is, you know, we were the Arabs of uh, Europe. We were the dark people of Europe. We were the, uh, you know, and everything. So uh, we kind of uh, take care of uh, Europe's purity uh, nowadays. Which, um, which is kind of funny, you know. You, um, yes. One of the things that we here in this center, but in many places, especially in Germany, but also in other countries, of course, and I think also in Israel, do talk about and think about is uh, that the, the survivors are slowly, their voices are slowly disappearing. Uh, they're either becoming tired or they're not alive anymore. And one of the questions is, how do we continue? How do we continue this joint or not joint uh, conversation? Um, and I think the second generation didn't have an easy life, often growing up in traumatized families, uh, in uprooted families, um, and trying to make amends in many ways. Um, and so interestingly, it seems to be the third generation that raises their voice on many sides, um, the children of perpetrators as well as the children of victims. And your book is one of those um, documents of the third generation uh, that I think shows us that there is a 
continuation uh, of this of this uh, um, n narrating the events, talking about the events, uh, showing us how we can do it possibly. Yeah, my guy, my guide is looking, you know, really hard to find the, the last survivors who can come with him because in past years, in every delegation like this, there was also a survivor who went with the young people and uh, told, told them his personal story. But uh, very sadly, they, you know, the, uh, many of them uh, uh, passed away. And uh, many of them are not in a condition to go to those uh, tours anymore. So he's looking for one of them. And he goes to a place, a remote place in Israel to persuade him. And he tells him, listen, we'll take you to, uh, to the town in Poland where you were born. And in return, this kind of a deal, you'll go with, uh, with us to Auschwitz when, um, where you were uh, back then. And, um, and the old man can't handle it, you know. He takes him there and he collapses there. It's too much, it's too much for him. Um, yeah, we, we are getting into a new phase where w there will be no, no more survivors. Of course, there will be the films and the, what the Spielberg uh, archives did, this very important uh, mission, but no, uh, and it's also an important, it's also a very dangerous phase because it opens the field for all kind of manipulations and uh, denials, et cetera, et cetera. It and that's started already again. Yes. So there's documents yes. of Polish Holocaust uh, uh, denial and you know people that are uh, giving interviews there and saying, oh yeah, Auschwitz is the place where six million Poles died and uh, a couple of Jews. And that's why it's so important, I think, to express yourself in different ways. You know, it, when the survivors were, were still alive, it was something very problematic to write a fiction about uh, the Holocaust. Now, I didn't r write a fiction about the Holocaust. I tried my best that all the historic details would be um, exact and uh, precise. But um, the, the, um, it's, it's our duty to, to write about it, to talk about it, to make art on this subject, because uh, otherwise, it's, uh, if it stays only in the history books, uh, many few people read history books. So, uh, and we also face the, um, the, because the memory is not constant, it changes all the time, and the situation we live in changes all the time. We must kind of deal with it when the time goes on in, uh, in d different kinds of exp expression. That was part of my motivation to write it. Yeah, memory is, a, is it's or the, the act of, uh, of memory is, uh, is a process. It's never complete, and it's constantly going on. And I think this is one of the challenges that we're trying to face in institutions like this one is to bridge between the academic world and the world outside and to to open uh, the discussion for a dialogue, which is now actually what I want to do, to open the discussion for a dialogue and ask you for questions or remarks. Hello, my name is Samuel Weisberg. I have a remark and a question. As Miriam said, uh, Holocaust memory was installed in Israel qu at quite a late stage uh, in Germany as well, and they created a new word for it, uh, Gedächtniskultur, culture of memory or reminiscence. Uh, correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the majority of Israeli society does comes from an origin which does not have connections to Holocaust. And in my view, Holocaust remembrance or Holocaust memory culture is used as a national glue for national identity in Israel. And now I'm going further. Uh, the Holocaust did not fall upon Germany in one day or so. It 
had a uh, how to say previous story. One of the stories was that a group of inhabitants was taken out of civil life and was put under special law. And then the law was made more severe and more severe until they were taken out of society and exterminated. Now there is a situation in Israel, and I'm asking you as a lawyer as well, where a special law puts one group of the population over the other and will have special rights higher and more worthy than other ones. So commemorating Holocaust, one must bring this into public discussion and I would like to ask your opinion about that. Yeah, Fred, actually you, had, you raised two subjects. The first was that most Israelis nowadays don't have a direct family connection to the to the Holocaust, but it, it doesn't matter, you know, because uh, first of all, Israeli society nowadays is very mixed. So you have families of Sephardi uh, origins with uh, Ashkenazi origins, and uh, it's true that there was a, there was um, a very successful TV series in Israel uh, portraying a Sephardi uh, family from uh, Be'er Sheva, who is uh, in the Negev, in the desert. And the father of the family, who is about 60 years old, when they uh, sound this siren during uh, Holocaust Day, he doesn't stand up. He says, that's their, it, it, it's their day, it's not our day. Yeah. Um, there were other issues, by the way. The issue of compensation from Germany helped many um, uh, families who were from uh, European uh, origin uh, get a much better financial uh, economic position than the families who didn't have, uh, didn't get this compensation, which is also discussed nowadays in Israel as an issue of social, you know, injustice. But still, Holocaust for the mainstream of Israel is uh, uh, the issue of whether they had relatives in the Holocaust is, is ir irrelevant. It's very much part of our um, uh, national soul. There are interesting things because during the 90s, a huge um, a number of uh, Jewish people came from the Soviet Union from the collapsing Soviet Union. And many of them had a completely different uh, way to remember the war, because many of them served in the Red uh, Army. So they weren't helpless, those helpless victims, they, but they were soldiers. So they had a different uh, picture of, uh, of the thing. Now, about your second question. We have to be careful about comparisons because we, had, we have many, many uh, bad things in the world and many evils, uh, including our relations with the Palestinians, which are very bad and very unjust and should be corrected. Um, but it's not, it's not really close to, to what happened uh, during the 1930s, even though we must lesson, learn from history where nowadays uh, the government uh, is planning to, uh, to hurt um, the democratic institutions, it's, uh, it's a terrible thing, you know, and it may get to, to, to worse things, but we are not there yet, and I hope uh, we will not be. Um, also, the law you mentioned is a terrible law, you know, and there was a lot of protest in Israel against it, but once again, we must be correct about those things, it doesn't discriminate at the personal level. I mean, it, um, pardon? No, no, it's not even in the group. When you take the, it, it says that uh, only Jewish people will have national uh, identity, um, the, the, the right to um, um, self-determination nationally, politically, in Israel would be also only for Jewish people. That's what it says. It doesn't mean that um, uh, Arab people 
in Israel are treated differently by courts than uh, Israel than, than Jewish uh, citizens, but it's still very bad. It's useless uh, unless for uh, populistic and uh, purposes it, it serves no good purpose. Of course, the issue of the occupied Palestinian territories is different because they are not um, Israeli citizens. And there the situation is much worse because they are occupied people, they have no civil rights. Um, and that's, that's the issue that is most dangerous uh, also for, for Israel because on the long run, you cannot keep this situation going for, for many years, you know. Maybe you can uh, by force, militarily, but from a moral point of view, uh, you don't want to do it for, for many years, and that's the main um, um, problem uh, in Israel, which uh, I deal with, and it breaks my heart um, a few, few times a day or a week, because it's the, the real existential problem of, uh, of Israel. Now, I must say it has also, we are not the only ones to be blamed about it, you know, the Palestinians have their share because in... Uh, they didn't miss an opportunity to, uh, they missed all opportunities to get their statehood and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But still it's, it's a situation that cannot go on for many. And uh, I, I agree with you that, and I said it before, that we must learn from history, not just in the most extreme uh, uh, situation. We mustn't wait until terrible, terrible things happen, but we have to stop it uh, long before. We sit in this uh, museum here. Once you start uh, hurting democracy and hurting minori minorities, you don't know where it can stop. And in the, in the book, you add a very interesting discussion to this when the, this guide talks to the young people or kind of like listens to what they're saying and uh, is really irritated or even shocked when they kind of identify with the Germans more than... Uh, or identify or sort of are more uh, sympathetic to the Germans than to the Poles. Um, because after all, the Germans kind of like they appear to be clean and they appear to be the victors and they appear to, to, to be less contaminated than the Poles. And it also poses, of course, questions of where do you see yourself? Everybody wants to be um, uh, aligned to the successful uh, people, you know, with the victors at all. And uh, Germany lost the war, but when you look at Germany and its place in the world nowadays, economically and politically, it's, uh, you know, there are people who say that it won the, it won the war in different uh, means, but, you know, that's a different discussion. And you want to be a, a friend of, uh, of such a people and not with uh, other people. Um, there are problems of racism in Israel, and there are problems of uh, authoritarian, more and more authoritarian regime uh, we, we are having. Um, and it's, um, um, as I said, when you become a landowner or uh, you have your own home, and for many, many years uh, you, you gain sovereignty, suddenly it's your problems and you cannot hide all the time saying, we are the eternal victims. You are, now you are responsible for it. So uh, it's a very uh, crucial crossroads for Israel uh, right now. I always think about your title. Uh, what, uh, uh, how did you come to this title? What does it mean to you? Uh, in, in Hebrew, it's memory monster. Now, there is um, a passage in my book in which uh, my, my guy has a, s a small um, uh, little boy, uh, about four or five years uh, old, and uh, he's not much at home. He spends most of, of his time in, uh, those, uh, in, uh, in Warsaw, in, uh, in Poland. He has a small apartment in uh, Warsaw. And when he comes back, he's a child, um, uh, you know, he draws a little uh, painting for him. And there's a monster there. And um, 
And the guy says, this is a, the memory monster. I mean, he deals with it. It's a monster because it haunts him. And it, it haunts him. It is it, it, drowning in it. And uh, on the other, the other hand, it's a monster because it, um, it hits and, um, and hurts in all kinds of different ways around. And you cannot control it. That's why it's also a monster. I'm Ralph Deyer. Uh, how is your book received in Israel? Um, it's received well, but it, it didn't shock anybody. I mean, people know what's going on in Israel. People know um, the issue of those uh, tours to Poland is in much public discussion for many years now. Um, we know the problems we have. But um, uh, it began a discussion on all kinds of aspects. I'm talking a lot with schools, with people who go. To, it's very interesting because I talk to groups of youngsters who go to Poland. And um, um, I got criticism for te from teachers who told me, we have good children, you know, you just you portray them too harshly which is probably right because they are good children, but uh, you know, from parts of it, I take it a little bit to the extreme, but I didn't invent anything, you know, it's all uh, in the field. Um, so I think here it's more surprise to people than it's in Israel. Uh, in Israel, we had the second in command in Israeli army, a general who said, uh, in, uh, in um, uh, Yom HaShoah, in the um, Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel a few years ago, that the events, the political events in Israel remind him of uh, things that happened elsewhere during the 1930s. And he was very much criticized for it, but this was a general, not some, you know, uh, leftist uh, saying it. Um, it's a different discussion, a different book I wrote about the situation internal situation in Israel, let's leave it for another time. Hi, Magdalena Klishat, hello. I really enjoyed your book. It was one, possibly the best book I've read on uh, the subject of Holocaust, but from a very different perspective, because most of the literature is sort of following this, like always the same tropes, and it's almost like emotional masturbation. I can't stand it. And it's funny because at the same time, like a couple of months before, Takis Burger's Stella was published, and I don't know if you've read it or read it. As I don't recommend it. <laughs> the Wikipedia article is better. Sorry, very subjective. But um, it's you know it has always the same things like the the decadent Nazi officers, and it's it's interesting to to read this book as a German and being confronted with this story. And of course, I, I can I can. I have to like obviously question my own my own history, my own parents, grandparents, great grandparents, and the German way of commemoration. And it's interesting. I often feel that we are so proud of how we do it, and oh, it's so well done. But I personally feel we have like we have like this blanket of collective memory, but it's not it's not sharp enough. And I have to say, when I read the book, and in the end, the the wonderful uh, like uh, filmmaker gets punched. I was so happy because I'm like, actually, it's a punch that I deserve, kind of, because it's sort of this, it's, it's so comfy, you can read these books and you can you know, attend these talks, but then what does it mean? So I think my question is, what, what is your perception of German memory culture? Are you, are you happy with it? Is, yeah. I don't know enough about it, so I cannot really speak about it, you know. I, um, I wrote it from my perspective as an Israeli. Uh, I don't know enough about it. Uh, I, I really can't tell. You must admit that uh, Germany made the good work, you know, in uh, uh, overcoming the Nazi period. Um, that's part of... That, that's one of the reasons why Israelis and Germans could, you know, overcome the, the history. 
Um, I cannot say, thank you for your kind words, but uh, about Germany, I cannot uh, tell. I don't know enough about it. I think we all know it has been a very complex process. Uh, and uh, it feels like it's never over. I often encountered students would say, oh yeah, I've heard so much about National Socialism and I've heard so much about the Holocaust in school. And then you ask them, so what did you actually learn? And then they would say, oh yeah, there was this something about World War II and what else? Um, and then they, you ask them what they know about, well, yes, of course they know what Auschwitz was, but about ghettos or about beyond that, also Jewish history in Europe before the destruction, um, and then you see that, you know, it's um, often there is a feeling of yes, it's everywhere, and we've heard so much, and uh, but it's not in depth, and it's not, um, uh, it's often not doesn't go very far. There are many small initiatives everywhere in the countryside and in the cities of people learning the past of their neighbors of of their, their village. Uh, and I think there are many initiatives also in schools. Um, and these really go uh, deep, I think, and are bound to research that, that um, enables people really to understand. Um, but it's very different, kind of like, there are very different ways of approaching it, I think. Yeah, I think, I don't know en enough about it, but I would think the most important thing on, you know, for people to do is kind of, I was in Berlin once and um, there was this event and the, um, one of the participants told me she lives in a very small village somewhere, I don't know where, and um, she discovered there was one Jewish family living in this um, uh, village for many generations. And she started to investigate it. And that's a nice thing to do, you know, and uh, learn the history of, uh, because um, we are also, we forget that Jewish people lived in Europe for many, many generations and had life here that sometimes were awful and sometimes were, was good or, com or, you know, or quite good, but people live here and they had their uh, culture here and the whole civilization that was uh, destroyed in the Holocaust. But we must also remember this in order to honor them, not just uh, remember them as, uh, as dead bodies or subject of the extermination, but uh, uh, to remember their lives. I would just like to relate a story that was told to me by one of the young German students who was in the first group of young people who went to Israel. This must have been, what, 30, 40 years ago? And the tour company, uh, the, the young people were toured around with a bus, and the normal driver couldn't go, and they chose a driver who spoke German. And he didn't want to take this group. And at the beginning, he was very unfriendly toward the students, but they were together for two weeks. And this young person who had been with them said, when they left, the driver burst into tears. And they didn't understand. And he said, I wanted to hate you. I tried so hard to hate you. And after two weeks, I can't hate you. And I can't deal with this. Yeah, it, it, it wouldn't happen nowadays, you know. I just, I was in the airport. I, I came yesterday from Tel Aviv. And in the airport, I saw a new... Um, a fast food restaurant, it's called Bavarian Street Food. <laughs> okay, and now you have in Tel Aviv, not, not far away, close my home in October, they're making Oktoberfest with not the waitresses, the, the Israeli waitresses going with the traditional Bavarian uh, clothes. I go over there sometimes, you know, I walk by the evenings for sport and I say, okay. And um, so but that's the way it is, you know, that's the way life went on. But Bavarian street food, okay. And, um, um, what can I do about it? You know, but the issue of, of revenge is, of course, not on the table. And I also feel very uncomfortable meeting a young 
German or not so young, you know, all of you were, not, and, and there's a very heavy burden always. I don't want the other side to say I'm sorry, or it's, you don't have to say to me you are sorry, you know, you are not to be blamed for everything. This is not the issue. Uh, you know that Abba Kovner, you reminded Abba Kovner, Abba Kovner was um, one of the leaders in the um, uh, uprising in the, where was it? Vilna. Vilna. Um, and yet in, later in with the partisans in the, in the woods, and then he came to, uh, to uh, Palestine. And um, he had a plan to go to Europe and poison, uh, put poison in the water uh, sources of uh, German cities. Now, the Israeli it was a very young uh, state, but uh, the Secret Service uh, knew about this plan, and Ben Gurion uh, did something, you know. They, 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 of course, it, it was out. Uh, that, that was very, that was a good thing, you know, that taking it, uh, not, not being an option from a very early stage. We're not talking about this, we're not talking about personal relations. Um, but um, I have, you know, I'm not a politician, I'm not a historian, I'm not a philosopher, I just write books. So you can just express my uneasiness about things. Uh, so uh, that's the way it is. And you did it very well in this book, and I can recommend to all of you to read it. And uh, as I said before, you will be willing to sign it. Thank you all for coming. Um, have a good way home despite the rain, and see you soon again. Thank you, Ishan. Thank you, Miriam.